Welcome to my video about SN1 reactions, that's substitution nucleophilic unimolecular. An example reaction of this is when a leaving group falls off of a carbon that is not primary. It needs to be either secondary or tertiary for SN1 to play any role. For a SN1 reaction, the very first step of the reaction is going to be the leaving group leaving, and it will leave a carbocation behind. This is where we start drawing it together. So, I've got a carbon here, and I have three CH3 groups attached to it. That makes this a tertiary carbon atom. And I have an iodine attached to it. I'm gonna get a new pen, that's ridiculous. Ah. And I have an iodine attached to that same carbon. Now this carbon, because it is tertiary, is willing to hold a positive charge as a carbocation. The iodine will take both the bonding electrons and become I minus, which now has a full outer shell. I mean, it had a full outer shell here, but the electrons were shared beforehand. And the carbon that was there is now only bonded to three other things and is missing one of its shared electrons. It is called a carbocation, and they are most stable when they are tertiary, next most stable when they're secondary, and by the time you get to primary, this carbocation is so unstable, it will never have formed in the first place. That's why primary alkyl halides react via SN2 instead. Now, important things to show for the SN1 reaction include the leaving group falling off the carbon atom, it's taking both the electrons, so we use a double-headed arrow. And then here, we like showing that the intermediate is trigonal planar. This carbon is attached to three groups. It does not have an electron in its 2p orbital, or you know the 2pz orbital. And so all of these bond angles are 120 degrees. There's no three-dimensionality to this center here and we have to show that it has a positive charge. Some people draw it in three dimensions anyways. I'll draw that for you here. If you draw the carbon with one of the methyl groups down below, you can show one of the other methyl groups coming out at you out of the page, and the other one going into the page, which implies that it's behind this CH3. It's kind of like looking at this from the side. This CH3 is closer to the viewer if your eye was over here, and this one's farther away, that's why we use those two. The reason I like drawing it like this sometimes is because the OH- can attack from one side or the other, and this kind of makes it easier to look at. If you draw it like this, you have to imagine the OH attacking from above or from below. Anyways, getting slightly ahead of ourselves here, some teachers want you to put the carbocation in large square brackets with a plus charge. I know the IB used to require that. And the I minus leaving group, uh, sometimes your teacher will require square brackets around that as well, because this is a Lewis structure and its charge is minus one. In any case, the OH minus, which is now a reactant in the second step, not the first step, will attack the carbocation and bond to it. So you will end up with your carbon and your three methyl groups. There's a CH3, there's a CH3, there's a CH3, and there's an OH. And the I minus is right here. The minus charge of the OH combines with the positive charge of the C, and the product that is created is uncharged for that reason. Cool. This product is now tetrahedral because that carbon is connected to four other things. You should probably show some geometry there. I'll show one of these coming out at us and one of them going back into the page. Even if these three things were different, you're going to get a mixture of stereocenters because the OH could have attacked from above or below, or in this case from the left or the right. Again, if these three things were different, then OH, and then an OH comes in, that carbon, that central carbon would be chiral. It would be connected to four other things. Then you have to worry about RS and antiomers. But 
Because the OH can come in from one side or the other pretty much equally, unless you have some kind of long group that would be blocking it on one side, you're going to get a 50-50 mix of from the right, from the left. That's a 50-50 mix of R and S in antiomers. Cool. Now, let me show you why we call this an SN1 reaction. This is the potential energy diagram. You have your reactants here. The iodine falls off and you end up with your carbocation intermediate here. Then the OH comes in and uh, attaches itself and you end up with products usually lower in energy than the reactants. It's usually a slightly exothermic reaction. Although I can imagine there are some uh, leaving groups and uh, nucleophiles that would cause it to be a different way. I just always draw it this way. Cool. We have two transition states. This is for when the carbon is half bonded to the iodine. And this one is for when the carbon is half bonded to the OH. I'm not going to draw the methyl groups in there. The highest peak here is for step one, which is the iodine falling off. The rate determining step is the first step, the first hump, and it is one chemical breaking apart into two. The rate law for that reaction would be K times the concentration of your alkyl halide to the power of one because there's only one of those molecules reacting at that time. That means it is a unimolecular first step, and that's why we have one in SN1. It could be a little confusing. The SN1 reaction actually occurs in two steps. It's called SN1 because the first rate determining step is one molecule breaking apart into two. Uh, I've already covered that the trough in here is for the intermediate. And beyond that, that's the end of, uh, of what I'm talking about there. Hey, that's SN1. I have videos about SN2, E1, and E2 if you want to consider watching those. But otherwise, SN1's pretty easy. Do a couple practices. Just let your leaving group fall right off. Make a carbocation intermediate. And then let your nucleophile attack. Piece of cake. Best of luck.